those. Um, sorry, question? No question. All right. So, like I said, you could trace this further north. This is the Trans Pecos. Here's the Rio Grande River and the Big Bend going down there. And we find a slew of these 40 to 25 million year old rocks in the Trans Pecos. What is really interesting about the Trans Pecos is the number of volcanoes that are there. Not only is it volcano, rock, volcanic rocks, but lots and lots of eruptive centers. But you find eruptive centers throughout western New Mexico and up here to the San Juans of Cal Colorado of about the same age. They overlap in age. And the thinking is now in geology that these are signifying one glorious event. That something big is going on here and basically a north-south trend that starts down in Mexico again. Mexico not as well filled in and goes all the way up to southern Colorado. And it has to do with the major consequences of building North America as we see it today. So the timing is limited to this, this most recent period of geologic history. And we see volcano after volcano, particularly in the Trans Pecos, fewer numbers of eruptive centers, but big ones in, in New Mexico, and particularly in the San Juans. Um, this is an important area resource-wise. I'm not a resource geologist, but a lot of geologists in Texas are. For one reason is Texas is well known for its oil and gas, and that's basically outside the Trans Pecos. In fact, the volcano has probably messed up any chance of exploring for oil and gas in this region because it just simply got the rocks too hot for it to retain any of those great products that we commonly see here around the Wichita Falls area. But it does have something else. When you have lots of volcanoes, you get lots of hot water moving through the crust, and it turns out that the volcanic products tend to kick out a lot of heavy metals into those waters, so you get deposits of minerals out there that are of economic value. They've known this since the 1800s. In fact, this old mine on Mariscal Mountain speaks to that. This is a cinnabar mine. Cinnabar is an ore of mercury. So mercury, toxicology-wise, will make you mad. It's the expression mad hatter comes from, because hatters used to use, haberdashers used to use mercury to soften beaver pelts so they can use them in hats. So uh, you can imagine it's not a great material to work with. And in the 1800s, there's no OSHA. And this is in the middle of nowhere. So the average life expectancy of a mercury miner at that time was about 20, 21, something like that. Not a pleasant kind of environment to work in at that time. Uh, and we're not interested in the mercury there now because there are better places to get it, much safer and much easier. And the, the deal with resource geology is it's all about the money, so economics are in the driver's seat. You can find all the deposits you want, but if they're not economical to get out of the ground, then it's not worth talking about. But recently, everybody's been into cell phones and tablets and portable electronics of all kind, and they require a small amount, but a potent amount, of rare earth elements. Basically, the stuff at the bottom of the periodic table in the lanthanides, that's your rare earth elements. There aren't a lot of them, they're rare earths. There are not a lot of them on the surface of the earth. These are places where they're concentrated. For many, many years, China was providing them very cheaply. They're no longer doing that. That was platinum. Platinum is, is a little bit further on the periodic table, but stuff like lanthanum and europium, if you ever buy those really strong magnets, they're known as rare earth element magnets. These are the kind of elements you have to have in order to form those high magnetic fields. Uh, so yeah, it, um, the Chinese stopped selling them uh, as cheaply as they used to, so people are all over West Texas looking for deposits of these right now. It's a very, uh, very prolific thing to look for. All right, I had a picture of what the country looks like now in that No Country for Old Men shot. I tried to find a picture that I think represents the Trans Pecos during all this eruptive activity. And the honest fact is, is there's nowhere on Earth today to find an accurate analog of what happened in West Texas 30 to 40 million years ago. The best I could do is go to Indonesia, where there's lots and lots of big volcanoes, all erupting frequently. This, the topography uh, and, of course, the climate would have been completely different, although it would have been much wetter in West Texas at this time. Completely different than what you'd expect in West Texas. But this kind of eruption after eruption after eruption it's, that's not unheard of, and, and that certainly would be similar to what we, we see in West Texas. We have a name for this, uh, depending on who's doing the research. We call it generally the tertiary ignimbrite flare-up. Ignimbrites are ash deposits. So these kind of deposits that are laid down by small fragments of rock, that's what we're talking about. 
Sometimes it's named the transpecos ignimbrite flare-up, sometimes we call it the Rio Grande ignimbrite flare-up, but it's basically this big period of volcanism in West Texas. We want to learn more about it. So the West Texas, or all of this area, was underwater uh, before, before this. Before this. Okay. But and then by the, this time, it's high and dry. It's on top of it. And it's the volcanic. Right. And then they they were active and did what they right and now there is no activity. There's no activity. This is this brief period of time and it stops and it's in a weird place. That's the other thing I want to point out about this. There's a, there's only three ways to get volcanoes and they all involve melting the part that's under the crust of the earth, the mantle. So this stuff is solid down here. That's a common misconception that there's this big reservoir of liquid rock beneath their feet somewhere down there. There isn't. You have to melt the earth to get volcanoes. And there are only very small parts of the earth that will do this at any given time. This is one of the most common and prolific. If we go to Indonesia, this is exactly what's going on. Is that we have a piece of the oceanic basin what we call the rocky part underneath it, the oceanic lithosphere, which includes the crust and its underlying mantle. And it gets so dense, it has to go back down into the mantle. It sinks back down in the mantle, particularly when it encounters something more buoyant. I know it's hard to think of rocks as buoyant, but continents are fluffy compared to this stuff that's in the oceanic lithosphere. So it stays on top. This stuff is dragged down, and it formed under the ocean. It's interacted with ocean waters. There's ocean water percolating through it throughout its entire life on the surface of the Earth. When it goes back down, that water gets released into the mantle, and it starts to melt this part of the mantle, which is over our subducting slab. You get lots and lots of volcanoes. If you go to the Pacific Northwest, you see these, if you go through Central America, all those volcanoes are, are a consequence of that. Indonesia, it's the same story. Subducting mantle and oceanic lithosphere, uh, oceanic crust on top of it, releasing its water and doing this. The trick is, is this only happens within 100, maybe 300 kilometers of where it's going back down. So unless you have a subduction feature really close, you're not going to get this. And uh, although I will show you that Western North America will stretch over this period of time, it doesn't stretch that much. There's something magical happening here. There is volcanism like that in about uh, 100 million years ago. We see the emplacement of the granites that now make up things like Yosemite and the Sierra Nevadas as a consequence of that. But then all the activity moves eastward. But it doesn't do so instantaneously. And the thinking is, is that instead of that normal looking descending piece of oceanic lithosphere, we now have something that's going much, much shallower under the Earth. And when it starts to peel back after this period of shallow uh, subduction, is what we call it, then you start seeing the volcanoes that you see in West Texas. It's a special setting. We don't have a parallel to it on the modern Earth. But this is something that helped create the geometry of North America. In fact, we have a name for the part of North America that starts in the east in the Trans-Pecos and goes all the way to the Sierra Nevada, and that is the Basin and Range. It's the western part of North America. It looks like this outline now, extending down appreciably into Mexico. But if we roll the clock back to 35 million years ago, we find that this representation of the United States is a, a, uh, an attempt to try to geographically orient you to where the rocks would be, because the United States wouldn't have looked like the United States back then. California would have been much thinner, as would Nevada, and you get a little bit thicker as you roll further, further east, but not much. All of that's going to be pulled out like an accordion over 35 million years. And West Texas is going to be the major player in seeing this happen. All right, so I have a little video put together by Iris. I'm going to actually talk over her. She had, there's a, a narrative on this, but I want to say what's going on here. This is the center part of the Basin Range, also content. It goes down into Texas, but it's being pulled apart. A hallmark of the Basin of the Range are these mountain ranges, that's the range part, adjacent to these basins that get filled in from the sediments from the mountains. So this is not coming out very well. I'm not translating onto the screen very well. I'm going to try the movie on the, the uh, actual thing and see if my QuickTime kind of looks a little bit better with, with the uh, 
processor on this screen. All right, here we go. Yeah, that might be better. All right, so again, mountains, basins, mountains, basins, mountains, basins. In Nevada and Utah, the western part of Utah and, and near Arizona, this is pretty obvious when you're driving through them. So again, what we're doing is we're stretching apart North America. It takes 35 million years to do that. It's basically because we were subducting stuff off the West Coast, and we dragged a lot of that underneath the continent in the process. So everything gets stretched. The rocks on top break in these north-south patterns as a series of faults, largely running north-south. You get mountain ranges, and you get basins. This is where the rivers would be. The mountains start to erode, and the basins fill in, the valleys get filled. The whole area is slightly elevated by all this heat flow. And there's another video that would be very complementary to this, but we also see is volcanism on this eastern end corresponding to this as well in West Texas. All right, so, and that's on the IRS website. They do lots of nice little animations. What does it look like in Texas? Well, in the Big Bend, you can see it in the mountain ranges that basically go north-south throughout the Big Bend. The uh, easternmost one is the Sierra del Carmen. You can see it here. These are resistant limestones on the ridge here. Big valley over here. Young sediments in the foreground that have been basically washed off these mountains and dropped right there under high energy environments. So this kind of faulting is all through the Trans-Pecos. It's pretty easy to pick out in some places, like the Sierra del Carmen. In other places, it's a little more obscured because it's not as clear cut as the video would lead you to believe. So if we're going to address these kind of things, and the two big questions here are, what's the nature of all this volcanism that's happening here? And can we start to look at it on smaller scales and still uphold this general model that applies to the rollback of subduction and the stretching of North America? And also, what are the structural features? What are the preserved faults and bends in the rock that point to this? When we go out in the field, we have to do quite a bit of planning before we leave the office. It's important not to waste our time, particularly if you're going to travel, you know, 10 or 12 hours down to West Texas, that you have a mental picture of what you want to accomplish when you're down there. You want to ask questions like, well, how far do I have to trace the rock units? Is there a way to get at that? And what are the big scale features I can look at, like faults and folds and deformation? What are the small scale features I can look at? Because we have the tools here back in the lab to actually cut up the rocks and look at them under a microscope. We can see the micro scale features as well. Where can we see it? Do we have the right places to go look at it? Lance is going to be looking at the Dalquist property largely because it's our property. We can go there. In fact, that's a big liability. Can we get there? Are there roads and trails? There's a lot of West Texas that's just a whole lot of nothing. And the ranch land is very sparse out there because it takes a lot of land to support the cattle. So you can go miles without hitting a road. Climate, pretty harsh, particularly during the summer. Other hazards, yeah, there's snakes and <laughs> lizards and all sorts of things. But cactus there are. I keep. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> Permits, if you're working on a federal property, you've got to be properly permitted or a state property. Or if you're on somebody's land, do you have permission to be there? Let me tell you, the climate in West Texas is a little like this right now in terms of landowner permissions and getting on people's land. It's, um, it's a little suspicious of anybody who has any motivation other than getting the heck off the land. So you, you do have to be courteous of people, landowners, and, and their wishes. And like I said, the ranch land is huge down there, so one property owner can own you know, acres and acres of property. There's a good chance you're not going to get to see everything. So you do have to be judicious when you start planning these things out and say, well, where can I go? And you can expect changes because sometimes things happen and you can't get on land that you used to be able to get on or vice versa. So pre-field, you look at a lot of maps. Basically, you want to look at some aerial distributions of what's going on. Uh, this is probably the most robust way to get a handle on what you can expect. This is called a USGS 7.5 minute quadrangle. USGS is the U.S. Geological Survey, and they have thoughtfully gone and mapped all of the topography in, the North, in North America, right through Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, and these are robust. They're in the process of revising them constantly. But nonetheless, these lines are pretty good indicators of where you can expect constant elevation to occur on this. In other words, it's telling you a story about where the valleys are, where the ridges are. This is steep topography in here. Where the flatlands are, 
Now, well, that can certainly help with planning your logistics, but it also helps you start to determine some of the geologic properties out here because the landforms are a consequence of what's happening geologically. Volcanic rocks will be hard and difficult to erode, so they'll form these kind of table lands like this where you have steep slopes mantled by volcanic rocks. So you want to look for these things and try to get used to, to reading them. There's all sorts of information on this that's important before starting, like if you're going to use a compass, you've got to properly set it for the magnetic field in the area. And understanding how far you're going, that's important too. The Dalquist property is actually on this map, it's about the middle portion right in here. So coverage of Lance's area is, is on here as well. He's been using maps like this to start planning his endeavors. Also, very prevalent in this day and age, we live in a golden age of data as far as I'm concerned, and it's, most of it's online. Quite a bit of it's online. One of the things that's online, lots and lots of satellite imagery, very robust satellite imagery. This is actually the same area as that map. You can see there are black rocks, you can see there are white rocks. You may not know any geology, but there's something different going on there. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to start. Where are the differences? Can we get to these places where you change from one to the other? That could be exciting geologically. That's a good place to look. Not to neglect the areas that are completely covered by one color rock of the earth. There might be some exciting stories in there, but I guess if I were going to start, I would certainly look for places where we can easily get to that intersect this, particularly like creek drainages, which are fairly easy to walk up, as opposed to, say, the rugged hill end around it. Go back to the topography map and make some choices based on that as well. Um, one thing that's important to remember about geologic science is we've been doing this for 350 years, and rocks don't change that quickly. The terminology has changed, our understanding of how the earth works has changed, but the rocks that were basically in the uplands of Scotland when James Hutton looked at them 350 years ago are pretty much the same rocks James Hutton looked like at. And you can figure out what he's talking about and say, oh, I should see a granite here with this kind of mineral in it based on what he described. In other words, geology is kind of unique as a science because we do look backwards quite a bit in geology. We rely on older data because that data is still very robust in a way that it can't be in more dynamical environments like climate and, and such. So we can look through the past literature, even going back 20, 40, 100 years in some cases, and find valuable information. The interpretations probably aren't right in these older papers, but what is valid is, well, we should expect to see a lava rock here produced from a volcano. We should see a limestone over here. That probably hasn't changed very much if the original work was done well, and it usually is. So uh, a nearby location is the Solitario. It's to the south of, of the Dalquist location. It's part of the Trans-Pecos. Very complicated environment, but I can go to this paper, I think that's from 1999, and find valuable information. It will help feed our own investigation. When you end up in the field, what you do is you take a lot of measurements. There are lots of options out there, but you certainly want to make sure you know where you've been. So maps and a handheld GPS come in handy in this. That's my GPS. I also have an iPad. There's some instruments on that. And a map when I go out in the field. My, my goal is to never be lost, uh, both so I can get out, but mostly because I want to report what I've seen there. So I've got to tell people where I've been. Uh, we also need to be cognizant of geologic time. So we look for fossils if we don't know them. In a lot of cases, we can work our way in from known places and correlate stratigraphically where we are in the section, as we call it. And if there's any changes, tilting, bending, breaking, we want to do that. There are tools for doing that. In fact, this young, young lady is doing it right here. This is a Brunton compass. It's a pocket transit. It actually allows you to do inclinations and compass directions with one instrument. So you could start to say, well, what rocks are present? How are they bent around? In this canyon, we could see a nice line going through here. And with further observation, we find that, oh, there's a big break in the rocks between here and here. This is all debris on top of it, but this is a line here. And that same line's over there. This is actually offset on that line. That's a fault going through there. That's one of these basin and range style faults where we stretch North America. So this relates to the last 30 million years. This is something we want to look at in more detail. Maybe get some measurements about how that's inclined and what rocks it's going through. So there's lots and lots of examples of this in the Trans-Pecos. You can never get bored. Um, it is work, but it is work outdoors. Um, so, you know, that's, you have to deal with the elements, the sun, the rain, etc. But it can be a lot of fun because you're out there sort of in nature interacting with it. 
So it is paying attention and asking difficult questions and recording observations. Cameras, I got an old camera on there, but you know, even your phone camera, any kind of tool you can have to record what you were doing. The notebook, irreplaceable, particularly a durable notebook you can find in like bright orange or yellow when you've thrown it off the outcrop. That's important. That allows you to come see it again and find that information. You can hold on to that for years. Uh, hammers, geologists are fond of hammers. They're like golf clubs for us. We, we have a tool for every rock. So lots and lots of hammers. This is the front and pocket transit, and I'm wearing one of these as a hand lens because a lot of rocks are made up of small grains that are smaller than you really want to look at with your bare eye, but 10x power, 14x power, in a magnifying glass you can easily carry around. Very good for making quick assessments. Of course, a lot of what I do is say, well, this is interesting, let's learn more. Let's take some of this back to the lab. And I do not have curiosity with me, which would be handy, because then I could just let it do the work out in the field. I need to take the rocks back, which is probably the more economic way to do it. So you do have to be judicious about this. That starts before you go out in the field. You say, well, what kind of analysis am I going to do? Uh, how much